Alexander the Great by Philip Freeman Read to you by Leslie BestBookBits.com One of the few Greeks that the majority of the people can mention is Alexander the Great. Perhaps they've watched a movie about him or heard about him during a conversation. However, do you truly understand anything about Alexander or the reason he was really great? During the death of Alexander, his empire was the largest the world had ever witnessed. Even by the current standards, the quantity of land he succeeded to conquer is huge, extending from Macedonia in Europe to Afghanistan. This success has made him the prototype of the winning king. Let's look at the situations that made this king, as well as his empire, and follow him on a path really full of adventure. It would make anyone great. Chapter 1. Alexander the Great was born into the Macedonian royal family, and his gifts were recognized early on. Alexander was given birth to, to during the 356 BC in the northern area of Greece called Macedonia. Philip II of Macedonia, who was Alexander's father, was a legendary conqueror who achieved the remarkable victory of bringing almost the entire Greek states under his control. Although a striking father figure, Philip was immediately impressed by Alexander. One day, a horse dealer offered Philip a very majestic horse for a very expensive price. This horse was supposed to be untamable, but Philip rejected the offer. However, the young Alexander was about 13 years old during this time, and he intervened, beseeching his father not letting go of such an opportunity. Alexander's public flare-up made Philip angry. However, he offered a deal. If Alexander could go on to the animal, he would purchase it. Alexander was somewhat clever, and he understood the horse only would get when it was seen its own shadow. Therefore, Alexander basically took the horse into the sun and as soon as the horse was calm, skillfully climbed on it. The horse's name was Bucephius, and the horse became one of the most popular animals in history. Everybody, as well as his father, was stunned. Philip proudly stated, my son, you have to look for a kingdom similar to yourself. Macedonia is not really big for you. But Philip's pride didn't last for long. Certainly the young Alexander's gifts made his father feel threatened more and more. When Alexander did better than his father on the field of battle, Philip had gotten enough and started attempts to curb his son's increasing fame. In order for Philip to punish Alexander, he divorced Alexander's mother, Olympias, and remarried immediately. But in an attempt to make things somewhat calm, Philippe called Alexander to the wedding feast, where everybody went on to drink, according to custom, huge amounts of wine. When a guest proposed to make a toast to the happy couple and the likelihood of a new heir, Alexander threw his cup across the table in a drunken fury. Philippe took out his sword, however, with a stomach full of wine, he quickly fell to the floor. To run from the circumstance, Alexander and his mother ran to their homeland in the mountains of Epirius. Happily, but intervention efforts were successful and they went back home not long thereafter. Chapter two. Alexander's ardent military mind assisted him to move quickly through Asia Minor. Alexander didn't have any interest in wasting time with triumphant celebrations. 
He immediately proceeded to capture the cities of Sardis and Euphesus before attaining the ancient city of Miletus, which is now called southwestern Turkey. Because Miletus was a base for the Persian navy, it was a significant aspect of Alexander's strategy. Also, because the city offered to surrender at first, it looked like it would be captured easily. However, the word immediately came out that Persian fleet was fast coming and another fight started. Once more, Alexander succeeded in challenging the advice of Par Parmenian. When devising a strategy of attack, he saw an eagle hovering upon one of their ships. Parmenian considered this as a symbol that the gods preferred a naval attack and recommended to first attack the Persian navy and then storm the city of Melitus. However, Alexander understood the sign in another way. Because the eagle was facing landward, he chose to capture the city first and then handle the Persian navy. This led to a key victory. The city fell really fast that the Persian navy was never able to dock its ships. After capturing Melitus, Alexander made a curious choice that historians have been discussing ever since. He broke up the Greek navy. Arius, one of Alexander's modern historians, recommended that Alexander was aware that his fleet couldn't compete with the Persian navy, therefore he evaded defying it completely and concentrated instead on defeating the entire eastern Mediterranean coastline, a plan that he would have no place for the Persians to dock their ships. Alexander kept on confronting conventional military wisdom by declining to rest and moving his campaign forward with the harsh winter of 334 BC, carrying on his streak of winning. Furthermore, Alexander made use of rare approaches to take the port city of Telemesis. With small assistance from inside the city, he succeeded to sneak a group of female dancers past the gate so they could perform for the Persian soldiers. After much drinking, the soldiers, drowsy with drink, let go of their guard and the dancers killed the entire garrison, letting Alexander take the city. Chapter 3 unexpected illness and death extremely transform the course of history. Alexander's campaign proceeded and during the spring of 333 BC, together with his army, he had gotten to central Anatolia. This was the time when Alexander got home and disturbed some, got to this was the time that Alexander got some disturbing information. The great Persian general, Mimon's fleet was getting close to southern Greece and it seemed to be close to initiating an attack. Alexander was aware that in spite of Persia's cruel attack of Greece in the former century, the current hatred of Macedonian rule signified that Mimon's advances would be very welcomed. Alexander encountered a problem. Keep on defeating or go home. Nevertheless, what good would his present campaign be if the Persians captured his homeland? However, maybe the gods were really on Alexander's side, for at that point, Memon suddenly died after his health quickly worsened on the Greek island of Lesbos. Now, it was the great king of Persia, Darius, who had to make a choice. And with the general he trusted the most, he chose to cancel his attack of Greece and take his troops home in order for them to fight Alexander face to face. This is when Alexander's fortune changed for the worse. The extreme summer heat beat down on Alexander's army as they got to southern Turkey, and Alexander boiled, boiling took off his clothes and jumped in the Sidis River. However, the water was really cold, so Alexander eventually felt feverish and sick. It got really worse that a lot of people thought he, would, he wouldn't live. 
Fortunately, there was a doctor called Philip among the troops whom Alexander had known since he was a child. Philip suggested a risky medicinal treatment which Alexander accepted, understanding that or else he might die. But just before the treatment started, Alexander got a notice. The Persians might have bribed Philip to poison him. Alexander encountered yet another problem. Putting his trust in Philip or risk dying by not taking the treatment. Philip decided to cleverly take the drug and was well again within a few days. He set on to carry on his campaign. Chapter 4 in November 333 BC, Alexander first met Darius at the Battle of Issus. During this, the only thing separating the 23-year-old Alexander and King Darius's Persian armies was a little Turkish mountain range. Darius wished to meet Alexander on a big open battlefield where his greater number of troops would empower him. Rather, the Battle of Issus happened on a narrow stretch of land close to the Pinarus River. What happened after would go down in history as one of the largest battles in history. At first, Alexander's forces were pushed back. However, during a brutal counterattack, his right wing cut through the Persian army, making Alexander start fighting the last of Darius's forces first. This changed the events of the battle, and because Alexander was fighting across two fronts now, the Persian army started to crumble, and Darius knew that the fight was lost. At this moment, Darius and Alexander's eyes met, and Alexander charged him. This climactic instant was, has been memorialized forever in a mosaic that is shown in the city of Pompeii. With bodies scattered on the battlefield, the two kings looked at each other up and down, and instead of anger, Darius's face betrays shock. But in spite of this epic battle, Darius succeeded to fly from the battlefield without any harm. Now conquering, Alexander was in charge of a lot of Persian captives, as well as Darius's mother and son and they were both sure they would be killed immediately. But Alexander humbly greeted Darius's mother and assured to raise the great king's son as his very own. Shortly after, Darius sent, was sent on a peace treaty that offered to give Alexander the entire Asia Minor and a large ransom for his captive family. It was a large offer and to Alexander it was a, he was aware that his generals would suggest that he accept it. However, Alexander was not about to put a stop to this. Rather, he forged another type of Darius's treaty that took out the concessions and included insulting remarks. His advisors took the bait, and Alexander's met no confrontation in carrying on his campaign to defeat the entire Persia. Chapter 5. The time Alexander used in Egypt showed to be a crucial milestone in his life. After the Battle of Issus, Alexander proceeded down the eastern Mediterranean coastline and he got to Egypt after he traveled for a year. On his way, he didn't meet any resistance since the local population didn't love the Persians anyway, who had been governing Egypt now and then for centuries. During Alexander's stay in Egypt, he ensured that the Egyptians knew his aims to govern their land as a kind king who would respect their lifestyle. After going to the ancient pyramids of Giza, Alexander chose to establish an Egyptian city that would end up functioning as a permanent connection to Greece. Although Egypt's Mediterranean coast had a modest port already, Alexander understood that he would have to construct a considerably bigger city that could serve as the main center for trade and provide a safe port for military vessels. More inspiration appeared to him in a dream where an elderly man told him of the island of Pharos. 
When Alexander woke up the following morning, he knew where to construct the city of Alexandria, on the Egyptian coast next to the island of Pharos. In order to mark the city's borders, Alexander's soldiers started placing barley on the ground. However, they were immediately descended on by thousands of hungry birds. Alexander was concerned that this might be a terrible omen for the gods. However, his soothsayer, Aristander, assured him that the birds were a wonderful sign that predicted how the city would thrive and assist him to feed the whole world. From this moment, Alexander used weeks trekking across the barren Sahara to see an oracle of the sanctuary of Amman. This occurrence had a major effect on his life. Historians have varied on the reason he embarked on this risky journey. However, it's clear that at this point in his life, he was searching for some solution and wishing to know the significance of his journey. Alexander inquired of the oracle if he fated to conquer the world. The oracle answered with a nod and said to him that he would definitely end up transforming the course of history. Chapter 6 After conquering Darius once again, Alexander captured the ancient Mesopotamian city of Babylon. Alexander started out from Egypt toward the ancient city of Babylon. However, after crossing both Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, he was again challenged by King Darius's army, which had formed a camp on the plain of Guagamela. The time was set for another history's biggest battles. Still, Darius's forces were a lot greater than Alexander's army, and this time around, they added remarkable Indian war elephants, a view that Alexander had never witnessed before. The battlefield was fully open. Darius had the edge, and Alexander realized he had to devise a smarter strategy. It appeared to him the night before the Battle of Guagamela, he would ride his cavalry parallel to Darius's front line, which optimistically would push his men away from the middle of the battle and form a space that he could then attack directly through. It was an enormous risk, however. Alexander was really able to ride straight through the center of the Persian army and straight toward Darius. However, before Alexander got to Darius, Alexander was told that the Persians had also gotten through his line of defense and were killing his men. Obligated to allow Darius to run away, Alexander turned to his troops and conquered the rest of the Persian army. Eventually, Alexander was free to proceed with his trip to Babylon. As he got close, his eyes caught a city the likes of which he never thought of, the extraordinary walls, which modern sources say was a minimum of 300 feet tall, towering above him. Also, there was the city itself, structured in a great grid system with hundreds of bronze gates functioning as entrances. This time around, there was no battle nor bloodshed. The people of Babylon welcomed Alexander with music, flowers, and presents. As with the Egyptians, it's possible they were really happy to be released from the cool, cruel Persian rule. With the addition of Babylon, Alexander's empire now included three continents and a lot of ethnicities. Chapter 7 after a humiliating obstacle, Alexander eventually defeated the capital of Persia, Persepolis. From Babylon, Alexander traveled through the harsh and snowy mountains of Persia before eventually getting to the Persian gates, a thin mountain pass that led straight to the Persian capital, Persepolis. This was where the rest of the Persian army ambushed his men and caused huge losses. While regrouping, Alexander found another lesser-known route through the mountains that let him sneak up behind the Persians under the cover of night and kill the rest of the forces. The way to Persepolis was now open to Alexander. After years of journey and bloodshed, a lot of his fidgety soldiers considered the conquering of Persepolis as the grand finale to their tri trials. 
Therefore, when the city gave, Alexander didn't do anything to stop the horrible pillaging that followed. Although this action went against Alexander's personality, he was aware that if he attempted to stop his men, he'd have a full upswing and uprising on his hands and everything would be lost. However, at Persepolis, Alexander himself made a destructive blunder. According to one description of situations, Alexander, drunk at the palace of Persepolis, was persuaded by an Athenian woman that if he would do a good thing to burn down the entire palace, he would be rewarded. Nevertheless, it would be reasonable payback, payback for the Persians' burning of Athens a century before. Alexander accepted drunkenly and went on to light the first flame. He immediately came back to his senses as the fire spread and attempted to put out the fire. However, it was already too late. This incident is an unpleasant one for a lot of historians, and the fact that they put the blame on the wine and women is suggestive of how past Greeks blamed Helen for the errors at Troy. After the horrible behaviors of Persepolis, Alexander began his journey to eventually lay his hands on Darius, who had been captured as a prisoner after a successful rebellion by Basus, one of Darius's family members, who was now the new king of Persia. But when Alexander caught up with him, Basus immediately murdered Darius before fleeing. This cowardly murder extremely made Alexander sad, who at this point had grown to admire Darius as a worthy enemy. Chapter 8. In the hunt for Bessus, Alexander started a deceitful march that would ultimately take him to India. In spite of the feelings of Alexander, his army was really happy by the death of Darius. Naturally, a lot of them took his news as an indication that their fights were over and they could now return home. However, Alexander had a new aim, to ensure that Basus was disciplined for his cowardly betrayal of Darius. Aside from that, also Alexander had a persistent passion for campaigning that forced him to continue pushing his empire further east. Therefore, he gave up inspiring and stirring speech to his men that unbelievably persuaded him to carry on with their march. But he didn't know that Bessus was their new arm of pursuit. They were about to experience the deceitful Hindu Kush mountains bound in modern-day Afghanistan. At that point, Alexander had already crossed beyond his fair share of mountains. However, none of these could make him ready for this Hindu Kush. Not just as the usual height of this Himalayan mountains, about 15,000 feet, However, the passage as well is really thin that the army had to walk straight and single file, and all of this was done in the middle of winter. But the only good news was that Bessus didn't assume that Alexander was really wild to try his climb. Therefore, he didn't attempt to place any troops at the end of the pass. Alexander's army used five hard days to get to the other side of the range and go into the land of Bectra. Eventually, during the summer of 329 BC, Alexander caught up with Bessus and the village where he was hiding out and immediately handed him over to the Macedonians. When Alexander confronted Bessus, he was keen to know the reason why he had conquered his own king and family in such a cowardly manner. Shockingly, Basus said that he assumed Alexander would have liked it that way. This wasn't the word Alexander wished to hear, therefore, he went ahead to flog and torture Basus before sending him back to the family of Darius, who completed the work by killing him. Chapter 9. Alexander made it all the way to the banks of the Ganges in India before realizing his soldiers could not go on. During 327 BC, Alexander, together with his army, had used seven years away from Macedonia. 
He even got married to a local no nobleman's daughter named Roxanne. However, he wasn't ready to settle down. Alexander set his eyes on India. He had faith that, in defeating it, he would be able to be in history, go down as the king of the world. Defeating this odd new world started off peaceably, although not without misunderstanding. He got to the settlement of Taxilia in modern-day Pakistan. He confused the large group of men and huge elephants who were riding out to come to him as a threatening army. Fortunately, the king of Taxilia, Amphis, saw the mix-up and noticed that Alexander was planning an attack. He immediately rode to assure Alexander the show was basically their means of welcoming foreign leaders. However, some Indian kingdoms weren't ready to submit. When Alexander got to the kingdom of Paravas, King Porus was ready to start a fight. Also, it was during this fight that Bucephalus, Alexander's trusty horse, was murdered. Alexander could only mourn after he won the fight. In honor of his dismissed friend, he built a city nearby and called it Bucephalus. However, Alexander was, as well, losing another thing at this point in the campaign, the trust of his army. When they got to the Ganges, Alexander couldn't motivate them with one of his normal words. This point was emphasized when one of the generals delivered a speech by himself. He said to Alexander that the men were fulfilled to have come really far and accomplished a lot. However, they desired to see their families and homeland once again. This was met with a loud cheer. The general proceeded to persuade Alexander that the best to do would be to go back home and form a new army with the new Macedonian soldiers. He accepted after days of thinking deeply about it. Alexander was eventually returned home with seven long and bloody years. Chapter 10. At the age of 32, Alexander died just before he achieved any of his future campaign strategies. The walk home was somewhat unexciting journey, in spite of the fact that Alexander nearly drowned in river rapids and his army, his army almost died in the Gedrosian Desert. By the time he went home, it was already been 10 years since he'd left Macedonia and his empire was turning to the bigger world he had ever witnessed. However, Alexander wasn't the kind of person to be contented with a thing such as this. When returning home, he made himself busy by making strategies for growing his empire again. He visualized taking charge of the whole Arabian and North African coastline and being able to travel the whole distance of African coastline from Egypt to the Western Mediterranean. Furthermore, he began reasoning about how to react to current reports about a worrying tribe known as the Romans. Unfortunately, Alexander did not live too long after to accomplish all of his plans. Only three years later, when he left India, he saw disturbing signs starting to emerge. One day, close to the city of Babylon, Alexander was met by Chaldean priests who cautioned him not to go into the city. Alexander laughed at their warning. However, the priests insisted. At the very least, they said to him, don't go to the city while walking west near the setting sun. During that time, the setting one was usually setting sun. During that time, the setting sun was usually seen as a sign of death. However, Alexander was doubtful of the priests and did not listen to their advice. On getting to Babylon, bad signs from the gods started haunting him. While Alexander was out sailing, the wind swept across his crown. Also, worst of all, when he went back to his palace a few days later, 
an ex-convict was sitting on Alexander's throne, and he was putting on his crown. However, it wasn't until after a night of drinking heavily that Alexander started to become severely sick. As his illness kept on deteriorating, it started to become clear to Alexander that he would not live. When his companions inquired him who would succeed, he said his dying words, to the strongest. Chapter 11. Alexander's legacy would proceed to have wide-reaching impacts on the universe. Alexander's amazing 10-year campaign did much more than only cement Greek culture's power on a huge area of Eurasia. These impacts definitely cultivated his empire, which started to fall immediately after his death. Persia and India are the only two places that were forever transformed by Alexander. A series of kingdoms that combined Greek and Indian cultures emerged in Alexander's wake, and Hellenistic culture changed Indian art and architecture forever. For instance, the rise of statues of Buddha in the human figure is obviously motivated by the gods of statues of Apollo. Though Alexander was hated by a lot of Persia, he was remembered for his philosophical nature as well. The Quran cites Alexander's philosophic bent, referring to him as a philosopher king, whom God made strong in the land and provided the means to realize everything. In this manner, he started a Greek philosophical culture in the area that carried on influencing the Islamic age and its religious philosophy. However, the area that Alexander's legacy flourished the most was really a place he never went to, Rome. As the Roman Empire was beginning, they accepted Greek as one of their intellectual languages, and Greek art and architecture severely impacted their own work. Also, the Jews and early Christians utilized the Greek language to copy the Gospels. Also, because Greek was the main language of the Mediterranean after Alexander's campaign, this signified that Christianity had a real ready audience. Therefore, one could say that without Alexander, Christianity would never have reached beyond Roman Palestine. Alexander the Great by Philip Freeman Book Review Alexander the Great was one of the greatest military commanders of the old era. He prolonged a little Macedonian empire from Greece down to India. By merging the military experts with an ardent political mind, Alexander became the king of the biggest empire the old world had ever witnessed.